Welcome to Pacific Mammal Research's Marine Mammal Highlight Series. We are a 501c3 research and education nonprofit studying marine mammals in the Salish Sea off Washington State. In this series, you will learn about different marine mammals as we discuss interesting facts about each species. This is our way to geek out, share some information, and have some fun. We hope you enjoy the series, and be sure to follow us on Instagram to vote for which animal we talk about next. And without further ado, Welcome to the Pac-Man podcast. I'm Cindy. I'm Kat. I'm Trevor. And this week, uh, this episode, we decided to do a little bit of trick on you since it's April Fools. <laughs> uh, and we told you that we were going to uh, do the uh, gray seal at some point. We we're just going to tell you that we're going to do it. So we did a poll, but it was the gray seal versus the gray seal, right? So G-R-E-Y versus G-R-A-Y. And uh, which one won, Trevor? G-R-E-Y? Was it Ewan? One on the right. <laughs> so one of them won. Either way, it was the gray seal. So April Fools, um, but you're going to really enjoy it because as we, we've been hinting about, these guys are really interesting. Um, and so you're going to be happy that we did it to you. So uh, hopefully you'll like our April Fools joke uh, as we do the gray seal this week. So Trevor, as always, is going to start us off with the kind of the appearance and where they're at. And I'll let you go. So I'll kind of start off with where they're at first because some of the descriptors of what they look like kind of surprised me mainly because I don't know much about gray seals which I'm, I'm going to learn a lot today um I did know they were found in the northeastern U.S. portion like Maine even Boston area I believe it's far south um but and upwards into Canada so basically the North Atlantic on the east coast of the U.S. and Canada and just imagine drawing a line straight over to the Europe the Britain area they're over there as well and all the way up into the Baltic Sea. So they've been seen on sandy beaches and they've been seen on ice flows all the way up north too. Mm -hmm. um, imagine a harbor seal, but a little bigger and weirder, I guess. <laughs> yeah, their faces are weirder than the harbor yeah. seals. <laughs> so they're spotted just like harbor seals, but they are bigger and there's different subpopulations with different sizes too. Mm -hmm. So over in the U.S., I believe it was, yeah, it's they're actually bigger here. So oh, in the U.K. and Baltic Sea area, on average, they get about seven point or the upper end is seven point five feet for the males, and on average, males are bigger than females, and they can weigh up to six hundred eighty pounds. But on the east coast here, they can get up to eight foot ten inches at eight hundred eighty pounds. Oh, wow, that's that's quite a difference. Kind of big, really. I mean, harbor seals are max 300 pounds, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, they're big. So, so, so a, a really, really, really large harbor seal. <laughs> exactly. And they are spotted like harbor seals, but the spots tend to be larger instead of like a, you know, kind of like the Dalmatian ish size that we have here. The spots are generally bigger in gray seals and maybe less numerous because they are bigger. Yeah. They um, seem to be more like, again, it's that more coloration pattern versus like individual spots. Exactly. Yeah. yeah more like a calico cat maybe but like yeah black white gray yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> um but imagine a harbor seal space like if you're on microsoft word or something like that and you just pull its nose out <laughs> so i have a, i have a really good analogy to help people visualize this which one of my professors taught me um that harbor seals have the profile of a spaniel and gray seals have the profile of a greyhound oh okay you have the longer snoot yeah mm -hmm. what they call a roman nose <laughs> yeah. Basically, <laughs> longer headed harbor seal in a way. Yeah. If you want to get in the nitty gritties, their nostrils are a little wider, are separated more than a harbor seal, too. But mm -hmm. you're not going to, like, oh, that's definitely a gray seal. You look at the nose. <laughs> Excuse me, let me look at your snout. Can I see okay. your nostrils, please? Probably not. And when they're born, they do have that white lanugo coating, mm -hmm. like that classic baby white, feel, white seal fur. Um, but that only lasts a few weeks, up to three weeks, and then they get their spots and all that yeah basically just when they're when they're drinking the milk exactly yeah but yeah that's pretty much what they look like if you got a general idea of what a harvest seal looks like just imagine a little bigger and a little longer snout <laughs> and the noses are a little longer too i mean not like elephant seal long but right just in general a little longer yeah one thing i thought was really cool which i did not know is that apparently the males are dark with light spots and the females are light with dark spots oh yeah i read that i, I briefly saw that but didn't go in i was like oh that's not my, my section i like yeah well i like i i googled a few different places so i was like is that 
is that true? Because mm-hmm. I I'd never known that. But it, and just looking at pictures, I mean, it does seem to be correct. So I thought that was kind of neat. Hmm. Yeah. So there you go. Very cool. I have never seen a gray seal personally, but I think you probably have. I have. I, well, I yeah. grew up in Scotland, so <laughs> <laughs> they were outside well, my house regularly. Really. Yeah. That's what, like most of the, I, I was reading, and you'll go into that, but like most of the population in Europe is actually in Scotland, like 80% of them are there. <laughs> yeah, I think it's closer to 90% actually, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yep. Cool. All right. And did we do the distribution? I, yeah, just. Oh yeah, the, yeah, you're on the east side, yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I was like, it was, there was, it was not as long as some of the other distributions that we've talked about. <laughs> northern atlantic right and then right there oh i well, should clarify though coastal areas not like open ocean coastal areas right 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 elephant seals will go to the open ocean but here yeah they the, yeah i'll talk about that they they don't go out quite as far no. a, a fair amount but not too much um i always like to think too when i'm re- listening when i was reading like the different um sections and i'll talk about it in the uh in the reproduction that there's the western atlantic and the eastern atlantic and then the Baltic, but the Western Atlantic is our East Coast, and the Eastern Atlantic is the West Coast of Europe. So it's it always turns me around in my head. When that's well, it's the same there. as saying like the Eastern North Pacific, and that's us on the West Coast of the U.S. Right, exactly. Which is very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> I always have to do a double take. I'm like, wait, okay, wait, that. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> All right. Cool. So. Um, with diet and behavior. So these guys are, it's, there's not a whole lot of detail here. Um, they're, they're basically like a lot of other seals. They are uh, kind of related to the, um, the ice, ice seals. So that's why they, you'll still see them sometime on ice flows as Trevor said. Um, so they can be found alone. They can be found in small groups or in very, in large aggregations. Um, but what I thought was funny is that they, they say they are gregarious, but they're not sociable, which, seems counterintuitive, right? You're like, okay, you like to get together, but you don't like to talk to each other. So it means that they congregate in large numbers, but when they're congregating, they're actually still separated on in the haulouts, right? So they, they're all on the beach together, but not necessarily very close to one another or actually interacting. So it's like wanting to go to a party, but just kind of hang out in the corner and not talk to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> right? and we all we've all done that <laughs> um so i thought that was kind of funny um so with they when the haul out just like other seals they do it for resting um they do it for molting is when they they shed their fur um and then of course for mating and pupping season and so you'll see them on rocks and on beaches usually on uninhabited offshore islands uh, but sometimes they will haul out on more secluded mainland beaches and I'm sure there are places where they are doing it on beaches that are not secluded <laughs> as their populations grow or change and people are going to different beaches and stuff too. So you're gonna get some interactions. Um, they can be very vocal uh, and they can be aggressive. So you don't really wanna mess with gray seals, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later too. <laughs> um, they have very good hearing and very good vision, making them very excellent hunters. Um, and they eat a wide variety of prey. So they are opportunistic, which means they're kind of like harvest seals, honestly. They eat a lot of different things. They're not picky, and they will generally eat what is the most abundant. So whatever the smorgasbord is out there and whatever is the most there, that's what they're going to eat. They tend to like uh, eat things that are benthic and demersal. So benthic means it's on the seafloor, and demersal means it's near the seafloor. So they really like to go to the bottom. So they eat mainly fish, so they're mainly piscivorous, <laughs> said that correctly. Um, and so fish, um, sand eels are a really big part of their diet. Hake, whiting, cod was another one that was I saw a lot. Haddock, pollock, flatfish, um, they'll eat crustaceans, they'll eat squid and octopus. Um, and they've even been known to eat seabirds sometimes, which I thought was kind of crazy. I don't know if they're catching those on land or in, in the water, but <laughs> pretty interesting. They're just bored. Hmm? If they're just bored with the seabirds too. Right. <laughs> just like, yeah, let's just play around with it. Maybe they maybe they just like to play sometimes. Um, they also eat other things, but we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna save that for for later because it's kind of a uh, I'm gonna give you a little hint. It's a murder mystery. Uh, and it was a very, very cool thing. So we're gonna save that for later. So just keep in mind that they eat other things besides fish and apparently seabirds. <laughs> 
Um, so they feed in the open ocean, but not as far as Trevor was saying as like elephant seals that go out, um, usually within about 100 kilometers of haul out sites. So they, um, they tend to go, you know, they stay relatively close to those haul out sites. Uh, but they can spend up to 30 days at sea on foraging trips. So most of the time they're going to come back and forth uh, to those haul out sites, but sometimes they have an extended vacation as they're out looking for food. Um, they do not feed though during the molting or the mating pupping season. So molting I think is more like springtime-ish and then mating and pupping as I'll talk about is depends on the location. Um, but they don't eat during that time, similar to um, elephant seals too, as we talked about on another podcast. Um, they can dive pretty deep, so they can go up to 1,560 feet uh, and can hold their breath for up to an hour doing so. So they're pretty good divers and makes sense because they're going to the seafloor, right? If that's where they're eating most of their food, they should be able to dive. Um, they are pretty big eaters. They eat four to six percent of their body weight per day. So that's pretty a lot, uh, and especially with those bigger ones on the uh, U.S. coast. Um, but the key thing for gray seals is variation. So there is variation in their diet between ages, uh, between sexes, between seasons, between geographic region, and there's even substantial individual variation in habitat usage. So, <laughs> so there's not like there's, they're very, it's very broad, right? So this, all these things we're talking about are, they, you know, all kind of eat that stuff, but it varies a lot between those different groups. Um, and again, that kind of goes with what's abundant and, and um, you know, what, what what the, what's available to them in their area and at their age class and what they can catch at that time. Maybe juveniles are catching different things because they're not quite as good as adults at catching fish, possibly. Um, they live for 25 to 35 years and usually females generally live longer. That's kind of a normal thing because males are the ones, in, in mammals in general, males are the ones that fight more. So are more, li <laughs> more likely to get in trouble. <laughs> um, uh, females become mature about three to five years of age and males around six, though they are probably not socially mature until eight. And this is also fairly common. So many species, including humans, right? You can start having babies much earlier than you could probably socially get a mate. <laughs> right? You got to learn those rules of the society and um, what, you know, what attracts the females or, you know, and males and whatnot. So um, they have to become a little bit more um, socially mature before they actually start to have offspring. Um, so they do uh, aggregate in those large groups for the mating and pupping season. On land, males will mate with many different females, uh, very similar to other seal uh, species. Um, and they, will, they may fight for uh, position uh, in that group of females with other males. So they'll fight um, and they'll cause deep scars on their necks from, uh, from that fighting. So it can get a, a little intense if they decide to uh, bring out the, the flippers or the teeth, I guess. Um, so what's really interesting though, is so we know here we said that they don't feed during mating season. However, um, there are some males that they've shown that have taken up a different strategy. Um, and they've been shown that they, some of them will make short foraging trips in between bouts of copulation events. So in between mating times. Um, and the key thing to remember is how long you can stay and how many times you can mate with another with other females is limited by your energy reserves because you're not eating during that time. So if you can go out and get a quick snack and then come back, you have a little bit more energy to be able to stay longer and mate with more females and hopefully have more offspring. Um, so that's an interesting one that, you know, I wonder why certain individuals like you know, figure that out. Like, oh, hey, if I just left for a second, <laughs> got some fish, came back, I might be able to do more. Um, and keep that in mind, keep, put a little pin in that too, because when we talk about the murder mystery, that, that idea will come back uh, um, about what the males are doing and if they're um, not feeding during that time. But the females uh, generally do not uh, feed while they're nursing. So for the females, they um, uh, have about 11 month gestation and just like other seals they and sea lions, they have delayed implantation. So that 11 months includes a three month delay in implanting of the embryo. Um, the pups are born as uh, Trevor was saying, on, they are seen on land or on sea ice. So they are born um, on land or sea ice depending on their location. Um, and again, in the Western Atlantic, which is our east, the US East Coast, <laughs> It's December to February. 
On the Eastern Atlantic over in Europe, it is the September to November, and in the Baltic, it's in March. So very different um, pupping times, depending on location. They are a whopping 35 pounds at birth, and I <laughs> couldn't imagine giving birth to that. 35? Um, hmm? 35 pounds? 35 pounds, that's what it says. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's... Ugh. <laughs> I gave birth to, you know, an eight pound, and that was plenty. <laughs> Um, so, and as um, Trevor said, they have that Lanugo coat, uh, Laguno, Laguno. I always want to put an extra N in there um, for some reason. Uh, but they have that white coat helps absorb sunlight and traps heat. So it keeps them warm before they have that blubber layer. And how they get that blubber layer is they nurse for about two to three weeks on very high fat milk, which is about 60%. Again, this is very similar to, those, to, the, to the ice seals that the shorter amount of time you nurse, the higher fat content it has to be because you got to pump that, that baby up to give it enough blubber before the mom leaves. So they gain about three pounds per day, getting that thick blubber layer. And um, that they live off that um, for about a month after the mom leaves. So the mom will nurse and the mom leaves, the pup's just there by itself. Um, and that's when they learn how to forage. So they foray into the, into the ocean and figure out what they're doing. And I thought this was really interesting is that they actually did some recent research. This, the research I think was published in 2020 um, using tags. They put um, tags on pups that uh, the tags would get released once they molted the next year. So they, they did them at birth um, or right you know, close to after. And so after weaning, they would stay very close to their birth site for about one week and stay in waters that were shallower than 40 meters until about four weeks. So that first month, they're pretty cautious. They're just hanging out close to their, their birth site. Um, they increase the frequency of their foraging, that the foraging that they do until about seven weeks, and then it decreases. So basically what they're thinking is you got to punt a lot more when you're not as good at it. <laughs> and then once you get it down, you become more efficient. You're like, all right, now I can, I don't have to forage quite as much because I'm getting better at capturing the ones that I do. Um, and that goes along with how far they travel. So that increases with age. So as they get older, they'll, they'll go farther and farther and farther away from those haul out sites. Um, and this is likely due to their increased swimming ability as they get older. So I thought that was really interesting that they could actually track all that and see like, what is the development of, of how they get to basically being juveniles or adults and how efficient they are. So it just shows you how important practice is. Practice, practice, practice helps you survive in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so that's what I have for the diet and behavior. Like I said, they're very kind of generalistic seals, but the behavior that we're going to get into in a little bit is much more exciting. We'll get back to that murder mystery in just a bit after we take a quick break. All right, we're back. And now Kat is gonna take us into, again, the roller coaster of threats and fun facts. And then, and we will also get into that murder mystery we were talking about, which is, this was the thing that we were so excited to, to share with you guys. So let's yeah. get to it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So first of all, uh, I'll just talk a little bit about their status. So it's estimated that there are approximately 450, well, Worldwide, they're estimated to be between about three, I, got, I saw two different numbers. So I saw approximately 300,000 worldwide and or 400,000 worldwide. That's pretty close. I mean, yeah. So those are the ones that are like way far apart and you're like, do you even know? Yeah. So if anyone has better numbers on that, feel free to let us know. Um, 
Obviously the ones in the US waters are, and Canadian waters are separated into different management stocks, but just like many other marine mammals are by NOAA. Um, they are protected by the Marine Mammal Protection Act throughout their range. Um, and, you know, in terms of population numbers, different populations like Cindy and Trevor both mentioned, they are quite specific to different locations. So populations have experienced different fluctuations in parts of the world, um, depending on their different circumstances, but they are currently legally protected in the UK and under the um, EC Habitats Directive. So like Cindy mentioned, um, they, I think it's approximately about 95% of their population is located within the UK. Um, so the UK, including Scotland, England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, um, mostly in Scotland, as um, I can attest to, where they're <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Um, they're, they're like the harbor seal, like in here in the state of the sea, it's harbor seals in there. Well, we have harbor seals too. So that's the thing. So like, like where I grew up in the Shetland Islands, we have both gray seals and harbor seals. So it's kind of fun because you actually get to see the difference of them and like, oh, which one am I looking at? And that's where you get really good at identifying that profile. Mm -hmm. um, but basically for the most part, as far as far as we're aware, the populations are doing pretty well throughout their range. Um, in terms of threats, um, entanglement is actually a big one for these guys. So because they are often foraging in the same areas, these coastal areas as fishermen, um, you know, any kind of entanglement in gear, nets, pots, et cetera, are gonna be very hazardous as we've talked about in other podcasts. So they can either get stuck in the gear and physically drown, because again, these are mammals they need to come up to breathe. Or similar to the large whales, they could end up getting stuck in the gear and carrying it around, which as we've talked about before is, not great for your reproductive ability, for your ability to forage, <clears throat> excuse me, and for your general fitness. So that's obviously not something that's going to be helpful. And they um, might, since they're eating on the bottom, they may be interacting more with those traps and stuff than other species. Exactly. And they are pretty precocious. So they are, again, like curious, but also they are sometimes a little bit, uh, sometimes bite off more than they can chew um, <laughs> in terms of trying to get into things to get at prey. So um, yeah, it's an issue. They also, because they spend time on beaches, obviously they are at risk of getting entangled in other things such as trash or lines or rope that are left on the beach, plastic, all that kind of stuff. So that's another source of entanglement for these guys is actually our own litter and trash. And especially for pups, that can be really dangerous. Um, illegal killing is another threat. So unfortunately, illegal killing of gray seals is not uncommon. Um, firstly, because they are fairly conspicuous, they're easy to spot, which means they're easily targeted. Um, mostly this is coming from frustrated fishermen or boaters. Um, and again, this has been documented multiple times in the UK, I know for sure, and I'm sure on the East coast of the US as well. Um, you know, they've been known to be clubbed to death or shoot seals. People will just randomly shoot seals, um, blaming them for stealing the fish or assuming that any low catches they're experiencing are a direct result of gray seal presence in the area. Mm -hmm. um, as we've talked about in other podcasts as well, illegal feeding of gray seals is also an issue, um, which like we've talked about before, can also lead to changes in behavior, familiarization with humans who then might want to kill them if you encounter a different one. So that's obviously not great. Um, any sort of familiarization you want to avoid, um, especially for these guys, since they are potentially targeted um, by frustrated or angry people who blame them for things that may or may not be their fault. Right. So are, are they feeding them from the, from beaches or from boats? Or do you know? I, I think they've observed it both. I mean, wow. I think people will like toss them food off boats, but I know people have also like tried to like huck, huck food at them on beaches and stuff like that. Oh, interesting. So, I, yeah, it doesn't I, seem like always, a very smart idea. No, like, see, yeah, no, they're <laughs> like, they got large teeth and they can move faster than you think. <laughs> yeah. And also like, you really don't want to get bit by a seal because they carry mm. all kinds of nasty bacteria and viruses and stuff in their mouth. And well, seal finger thing is a real thing. Finger. Yeah, seal yeah. finger. Yeah. And it like numbs your, we have an, a friend who got it. Uh, not from feeding seals, but from doing a necropsy or, or something he was working with and he ended up getting it and it like numbed his whole arm and it took a while for it to get better. Yeah. One of my professors actually had, he had only a partial finger because he got seal finger when he was it like it? tagging an animal and uh, it like it was coming out of the um, anesthesia and turned around and bit him. And he was mm -hmm. like on location somewhere and couldn't get to medical help soon enough. And they had to amputate part of his finger. Oh my gosh. That's crazy. Yeah. So that's it. Don't, don't, don't get near them. <laughs> don't, don't be feeding anything. <laughs> seal finger is permanent too, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I think so. 
I don't, I, well, I think it might depend on how quickly you get it seen to yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, my friend, he does, I mean, he doesn't have any lasting effects from it, I don't think, but I think he got it, you know, he knew that he got bit or whatever and then was able to get help right away. Because if it's yeah, bacterial, I think, it's, I think it's it, very... it's, it depends on how quickly you can get the antibiotics or whatever. It's like a zombie yeah. virus. <laughs> <laughs> right? Kind of, seriously. Little zombie finger. <laughs> Cut it off. Um, so other ones, um, contaminants. So like most of the marine mammals that we talk about, again, these guys are at risk from contaminants because they are top predators. So you're gonna be bioaccumulating those contaminants up the food chain. They're also gonna be consuming fat rich hmm. food, which contains the most of these contaminants because they're typically stored in the fat tissue. So right. PCBs are a big one. Again, as coastal animals, these guys also encounter a lot more toxins um, and contaminants. And put a pin in that for the murder mystery too. Remember to come back to that. Yes, yes, good point. Um, you know, they're encountering not just things in the water, but also things on the beach or, you know, just runoff from local industry. Um, so again, these, these coastal animals are actually at a lot higher risk um, than animals who spend time out in the open ocean from contamination just because there's so much runoff and, and also risk of disease too. So, um, you know, We've talked about that before with the monk seals, um, where they're, you know, if you're a coastal animal, if you're flushing like kitty litter or things like that, or, in, you know, disposing of it incorrectly, you can actually spread viruses to these animals as well. Yeah. And the, um, the paper, one of the papers that we just went over on the, one of the episodes of the podcast was about the harbor seals and harbor porpoises that were got more of the antibiotic resistant bacteria. And it's the same thing from it, and the seals uh, and um, and porpoises were, were high, kind of high on those lists because they're near the coast all the time, mm -hmm. and so they're just uh, get more of that. Yeah, exposure. Yeah, so I swear these aren't going to go on for too long, too much longer. <laughs> <laughs> um, oil spills and energy exploration. So this is a big one for um, hmm. any seal really who's in these locations. So. Oil spills are kind of self-explanatory um, because they have fur. If you get oil on fur, it doesn't really do much to keep the water out or keep the animals warm anymore. And so they can, um, you know, experience hypothermia and potentially die um, in addition to potentially consuming it, which is never a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, as then we explore for more oil sources and or move into um, renewable energy, such as tidal turbines or wind farms, that's actually also potentially very hazardous to seals because a lot of these things have active turbines that are flowing in the water column. Mm -hmm. And or there's active construction to put in, for example, a you know, coastal wind farm. So this has been happening a lot in, um, in Europe right now. There's a big push towards coastal wind farms, um, tidal turbines. And actually my friend who is a researcher in Scotland that we will talk about more in a little bit um, is actually doing some work to determine you know, how detrimental these things are. Um, you know, a lot of places have tried using pingers or seal scares attached to some of these renewable energy devices in order to deter the animals because when these blades are going round, they're going real fast and the animals could potentially get sucked in. Um, I believe there's been kind of conflicting evidence about whether or not those actually work. Some people have suggested that they actually are more likely to attract the seals mm -hmm. um, simply out of curiosity to be like, well, what the heck is this? <gasps> What's that noise? Um, Sorry? I said, what's that noise? They're, they're right, saying, what exactly. Let's check that out. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I know a lot of the, for example, the tidal turbines, a lot of them actually have detectors and they will, they will simply shut down operation if a seal swims by. So it's kind of like, you know, it's like being a marine mammal observer on a boat. If you're, you know, if you're watching a construction site and a, and a marine mammal comes by, if you have to shut down operation, it's a similar thing, but they can actually use underwater detectors to let them know when an animal's in the area. That's probably but that is the best way to go. I mean, yeah, yeah, that is a big risk. Yeah. Um, and then vessel interactions is another one. So obviously direct boat strikes, um, harassment by boats, and also flushing of seals near haul out sites is a problem. So with any seals, especially during the pupping season, you know, you really want to give a wide berth to their haul out sites because the more frequently those animals get scared and, and go back into the water, the more energy expend they're expending, the more frequently they're leaving their pups. Um, it's just, it's not a good situation um, and it's very stressful to the animals. So that can also be an issue, especially in highly populated areas. Okay, so let's get into the fun facts. No more now, that now that we've depressed everybody. <laughs> uh, fun facts, and then we'll get into the murder mystery at the end of this. So 
as you all like know, I, as you all know, I like to do the Latin names because they're super fun. And this one's hilarious. So it is. I read names, it. I was like, oh my God, I can't wait to do this. It's so good. <laughs> it's so common name, gray seal, they're gray. That's fairly self-explanatory. Um, although when looking at pictures, I'm like, gray is like they're a very generic really term. They're like brown. It's not really that accurate, really actually. Yeah. They're like a grayish brown. And then some of the males are like almost black. And I'm, yeah. anyway, <laughs> but their Latin name is Halicurus grippus, which means hook nosed pig of the sea. <laughs> Mic drop done. right there. I think that's possibly one of the coolest Latin names that we've done so far. I think it is. That one's pretty impressive. So cool. <laughs> hook nosed um, pig of the sea. So good. So again, as I mentioned, the males typically are dark with light spots. Females are typically light with dark spots. So if you ever get to see a gray seal, you can see if you can spot which kind you're looking at, male or female. Um, they are the largest breeding land mammal in the UK, which makes sense after hearing how large they are. Even though I've seen them multiple times, I'm like, I'm terrible at estimating size just by sight. So I'm like, wow, seven feet, that's gnarly. Um, as Cindy mentioned, they are very vocal. And one of the really cool things that they discovered about these guys is they will actually clap underwater to communicate. With their flippers? So there's, yeah, with their flippers. So they literally like, they make percussive slaps with their, with their flippers. I actually have, I have a link to a video um, that we'll include in this. Um, it's super interesting. And they think that it's in order to either ward off competition and or potentially attract mates. Cause it's, it, I guess they see it a lot more during breeding season. I hear you like, hey, hey, come here. Uh, look at me. I'm so cool. <laughs> right. Or like, get out of here. Like leave. Right. This is my spot. So that's super that'd be so cool. If you could be like, okay, this is, this is an attractive clap. And then this is an angry clap. Like do, do right. they know the differences between those? It's crazy. Right. Also just think about the effort that it would take. If you're a seal, think about the muscular effort that it would take to like make a percussive clap with your four flippers underwater. So remember that these have really short flippers. They're kind of like the T-Rexes of the sea. Yes, exactly, Trevor. It's like, <laughs> that's what I have the students do. <laughs> I have the students do that when I'm teaching them about seals. I'm like, okay, now put your elbows by your side. Now try to clap your hands. And you know, that's what a seal would be doing. So like, how can they do that? That's kind of crazy. Isn't that cool? That is cool. Um, yeah, so like I said, we'll include a link to a video on that one because it's really interesting and they got some really cool footage of it. Well, um, and then also if you're, if you're, you try to clap underwater. Like- That's what I'm saying. It's hard it's to hard. do. <laughs> Like, yeah, it's really it's hard to make a loud noise. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like I said, they are very diverse in the vocalizations that they make too. And so some trained animals have actually even been taught to replicate songs, which is pretty <gasps> wild. So yeah, I'll see, I think I've seen some videos of that too, where they, I think there was one that they trained to try to do the Star Wars song. So I'll, oh, I'll try dude, to find that too. That's awesome. <laughs> they, and I, they did say that the, um, the, the pups are very vocal so that the, the females can find their pups again if they you know, get flushed out or something. Right. So. Right. Cause imagine you're on a beach with a bunch of other seals. It's pretty similar to penguins, right? Where yeah. you're on a beach with a bunch of other penguins, you need to have that call to be able to find your mom. Exactly. Um, and then last one, before we get into the big story mm. is that they can swim up to 35 kilometers an hour, which is 22 miles an hour when being chased. So they can get pretty, they are, they're pretty yeah. fast underwater if they need to be. So I said one other thing that I saw with the name is they also called them, I think, like horse seals or something like that, because their nose oh. is so long, it was kind of like a horse head. Which oh, I, interesting. That makes sense. That, that caught my eye because I love horses, but yeah, <laughs> I was like, oh, interesting. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So the moment you have all been waiting for. So like that's Cindy that's alluded that's to that. already, gray seals eat more than just fish and crustaceans and occasionally seabirds. Mm -hmm. They also eat mammals specifically other gray seals and harbor porpoises and, other, and potentially other harbor seals harbor seals and hooded and harp possibly yes yes so i'm going to give you a brief background on this because when i was at university they were actually studying this and at the time when i was an undergrad they still didn't know what was going on it wasn't actually solved until um, I had completed my master's and one of my fellow master's students who went on to do his um become a research assistant at St. Andrews University was very instrumental in figuring all of this out. So big shout out to Joe Onufriu, because you're awesome. And I'm so excited that I get to like talk about you every single time this comes up, which is really exciting. <laughs> um, so this was actually, this was a mystery surrounding seals that kept washing up or being observed on beaches that had a very distinctive mutilation to their body. So first of all, just disclaimer, if you are squeamish, you might not want to listen to this section because it's going to get a little gory. 
It is, and I'll, and we'll have a link to the paper and they have pictures. So that's also just, just FYI. Fair warning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this was actually first observed in, and noted in Nova Scotia in the late 1990s. Um, and researchers there were starting to see a lot of these seals showing up that had this very distinctive, what they called a corkscrew mutilation to their body. So basically the, the skin was literally ripped off in a corkscrew fashion around the seal, Spiral. usually starting at the corner of the mouth. Mm -hmm. Um, and they did a bunch of research in Nova Scotia trying to figure out, well, what the heck is causing this? And they actually ended up, long story short, they ended up settling on the Greenland shark as a possible suspect. Now, simultaneously in the UK, harbor seal numbers were beginning to crash. And, you know, that's a kind of worrying because they don't actually know what's causing it. So in the 2000s, in Scotland specifically, they were really starting to put a lot of effort um, into determining what the heck was going on with harbor seal numbers. Was there no prey? Was there, you know, what was happening? And they started finding these mostly adult females um, showing up in around about July or August with this very similar corkscrew wounding. Um, and I don't think they actually had been in communication with Nova Scotia at this point. So my friend Joe was cool enough to get to actually do a whole CSI thing with this where they had to make wax models of seals and then throw them into various different blades right. and various yeah, different things, pulverize them with like hammers, all kinds of stuff, like trying to simulate what these wounds actually were and figure out where they'd come from. Because that was the other thing is besides the sharks, the other thought was that it was from propellers because it would kind of make sense as the propeller sliced it and then the seal went through it, it would corkscrew like that. So, Correct. And that so was actually what they settled on. So mm -hmm. at St. Andrews, they actually decided from this process, they actually determined that it was most likely from these, ver these very specific ducted propellers. Uh, where you'd get kind of, the, they were, you know, thinking that maybe this was making some sort of noise that was attracting the females, maybe it sounded like a male, maybe they were just curious, because they couldn't mm -hmm. figure out why it was specifically mostly females. And they're like, oh, well, maybe they get close, and then they kind of get sucked in at that nose point, and that's, then they get, you know, turned through. So at that point, this is like mid-2000s at this point, seemed like everything had been solved. Right when they were about to publish that paper, they then either, I don't remember if the Nova Scotia people either published their paper or they found out about this other paper from Nova Scotia. And they're like, wait a minute, these people are saying it's the Greenland shark. Well, hold on, wait a second. So everything kind of took a pause. And, you know, they went back to the drawing board and said like, well, could there be Greenland sharks in the UK that are causing this? Kind of kept going back and forth. Nothing was really making sense until 2014. Until dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. And I, I literally wrote down, I'm like, the mystery was brutally solved. <laughs> I'm, I, it's very intriguing. So don't melt great seal. Yep. So if you are, if you are familiar with Scotland, um, the Isle of May is just off the coast of St. Andrews. So it's a really beautiful island. Um, there's a breeding colony of gray seals there that are studied by researchers at St. Andrews. They go out every single year and watch these animals, record them, take all kinds of video and, and study their, their breeding behavior. And one of the doctoral students out there actually witnessed a male gray seal grabbing a weaned pup, dragging it into a pool of water and drowning it. And then when the pup was dead, the male began to rip its skin. And if you imagine a seal, they've got claws on their front flippers. So he's literally like putting it in his mouth and then pulling away with his flippers, right? Yeah. So it's ripping the skin off to get at the blubber, mm -hmm. um, which is why Cindy was mentioning to put a pin in that earlier. Mm -hmm. Well, that, um, and, and, the, and the porpoises we'll talk about in a minute. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a sec. So they've actually, you know, like I said, they've been studying this breeding colony for years and they've never seen anything like that. Um, so it does seem like this is kind of, obviously it's been a behavior that has been occurring for a while, but it doesn't seem like this is something that has happened, either has not happened that frequently up until now and maybe is increasing its in frequency or has, has been occurring in areas that are not at a breeding colony where they're being observed, right? So it's, it's happening in areas that they weren't monitored. Um, but specifically on the Isle of May, I think they saw that same male take like five other pups. It was five weaned gray seal pups that they saw uh, him feeding. Yeah, yeah. So and it was um, one specific male. It wasn't all the males. Right. It was that specific male, which is pretty gnarly. Right. Um, 
So, and again, because the, you know, because the researchers were literally videoing this and were on site and able to capture it when they compared the, the mutilations to what they'd been seeing previously, it matched up. And it, it made sense that that was why they were seeing what they were seeing, because again, you're, you're envisioning the seal pulling away and ripping basically lengths of flesh off the animal mm -hmm. um, and propelling them away from, away from you would cause that circular um, circular motion. So yeah, pretty they, grisly. Yeah, and they, they, they looked at those compar and compared them to like the, the other ones you were talking about in Nova Scotia, and it was basically very similar pattern for the gray seals, the harbor seals, the hooded seals, and the harp seals that all had similar ones. And now, so they, you know, obviously can't say that, yes, the, the gray seals are the reason for every single one of them, but the large amount of evidence shows that it is, is a lot of them most likely are from gray seals because they also, the only places they see those patterns are where gray seals overlap with those other seals. There are places where they see them and there's there's a bunch, there's not, you know, not a lot of boat traffic. So like, <laughs> it's not likely boats that are doing it. Um, and what's interesting is that the seasonality of it seems to go along with the breeding times for the different seals. So they see these spikes when the, the seals, are, the babies are being born and the babies have, when they're born, they have lower, metabol lower metabolism when they're after they're weaned and lower movement, they can't move as fast. So they're just, they're easier prey. So, but like Kat was saying, why? Why is this happening now? Is it just certain individuals that have learned this behavior, but it's on a widespread you know, geographic location? So it's interesting. Yeah. And so one of the, you know, again, like I think there's still, we still don't have a good idea on that really of what's going on. I know they've talked about possibly increases in competition because gray seal numbers are actually doing very well. Right. So there's a potential that like there's an increase in competition. So maybe, you know, just as, as you mentioned, Cindy, like these guys are very diverse and very capable of trying out different food sources. So maybe it's just like you said, one or two individuals that got creative and are like, oh, hey, well, actually there's a tasty morsel sitting right over there. Right. So it goes that. back to that. Like if I can just eat a snack real quick, I can stay longer and have more mating opportunities right. rather than going out to forage. Or like, I'll just eat this thing right here. And right. exactly. What's really interesting is that the, what's going back to the eating the blubber, right? So most of the time that's you eat the skin and the blubber, um, but not a lot was taken off of many of these seals. And one case, there was one that was dead 20, less than 24 hours previous, like just down the way a little bit. And he had gotten a new one and was eating a new, the, like a new one. So it, they may not have to eat a lot of the, the pup to gain that energy reserve that is helpful to them, I guess. Or maybe he's just not experienced and he doesn't know what you're supposed to do. So he's just trying out new seals. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. And I mean, if it is a newer emerging behavior, that would make sense that you're right. still, it's, it's like, how, I don't really know what this is. What am I doing? But I'll bite some um, They had one male that they said they could kill eight to 14 pups in a 10 day period. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. So not only are we talking about killing other mammals, this is actual like cannibalistic behavior right. and where it's not just killing. Right. So we know other mm -hmm. mammals will kill the young of other, other of their species, but this is literally consuming, actively killing and eating. Right. Um, other gray seals and like said like cindy said multiple other seal species and harbor porpoises so yes. if you think about the size of a gray seal it's about the same size as a harbor porpoise if not slightly larger a little bigger yeah um so again this has actually been confirmed in multiple different parts of europe um reports in belgium france netherlands german and dutch waters um and they actually got some really crazy video footage in wales in 2015 um that literally showed the gray seal biting and eating a harbor porpoise that it had just killed. So I'm not sure up until that point if they'd actually had visual confirmation that right. they the seal had killed the animal first. Right, because they could have just been just like they scavenging. died, or stranded, or died, and they ate, ate it as it was. Right, 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 more opportunistic. Whereas this this seemed to indicate that like no, it literally had just killed that porpoise and was then consuming parts of the porpoise. And they they said from some of those observations that that they varied, but evidence showed that they may drown them. So they may like go on top of them to try to drown them, and then also utilizing an ambush or sit and wait strategy. So kind of oh. like jumping out and then like I guess jumping on them and drowning them, and that's crazy. But they yeah, eat well, and again, again like the skin and blubber. So yeah, yeah. So that was one of the things when I was reading um, a paper on it where they were saying that the the harbor porpoises did all have quite similar. Again, not not the corkscrew pattern, but similar mutilations that indicated mm -hmm. that there, there was a consistent cause that was happening. Right. Um, so yeah, so that's they're gnarly. A, that's a, they're gnarly. So see, you told you they were interesting. 
kind so, of a yeah. grisly way to end, but um, yeah, these guys are pretty gnarly and it's still an emerging thing. Like I said, we still don't have a good handle on specifically why we're seeing this behavior now, um, especially in some of those populations that have been very well studied. Um, but obviously it's been happening since at least the nineties that people have noticed. Um, so be interesting to see how that progresses over time now that we know what they're capable of and know what right. we're looking for in a way. Will it spread um, to other species? Is it just certain individuals that are doing it? Will it become more widespread if there's more Right. And I mean, that's a postulation. Like people have suggested, maybe there are literally just psychogracials who are like, <laughs> they just turn into murderers and they're like, cool, okay, here we go. Well, and it's there's not, like but... the, the sea otter here in the Salish Sea that likes like, to take river otters. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it might just be that certain animals get a taste for it. And again, you know, same thing as, as in, say, for example, lions that get a taste for human flesh and they become man-eating lions. And it's, it's you know... But the other thing too is, I mean, again, there, there isn't really a lot of male parental involvement in um, mm. raising of babies, but like, that's something to consider. Like, is that something that could then be passed down to other, or if it's observed, you know, passed through the population. So right. very interesting. Lots of questions. Well, just like any other good science, you answer one question and you have about four or five more. <laughs> that's the way it goes. <laughs> yeah. All yeah. Right. So that's our gray seal murder mystery. Murder mystery. So if you see a cor anything corkscrew, blame the gray seals. <laughs> <That's what they laughs> do. All right. Well, so that so like we said, they're super interesting. There's lots to there's so there's obviously too so much more we need to know about them because we thought we had a handle on their diet, but now there's this. And a lot of diet studies are done on hard remains. So on the otoliths, the ear otoliths, or bones that you find, if they're eating blubber of of mammals, you're not going to find that in the diet studies. So it's possible that they've been doing this for longer and we just haven't picked it up. Um, you know, so we need other ways of looking at their diet, you know, look at DNA and tissues and things like that beyond just the hard parts for this kind of thing. So just another, another thing to think about as we, uh, all the research that we have yet to do and to learn about these animals and so many others. So um, with that uh, end, that is the end of our gray seals. We hope you enjoyed. Um, it's not an April Fool's. This actually, they actually do do this. <laughs> um, so we hope you had fun with it today uh, as much as we did uh, we were very excited to do this one so the next time we have a marine mammal highlight we will let you choose again we promise I'm um, not sure which ones we'll choose now um, but we'll we'll find some good ones to to match up um, and next episode I think we are going to have another interview uh, we have if you have a chance you can listen to humane nature uh, it's a podcast that uh, I was just on uh, the podcast talking about um, swimming with uh, dolphins. Um, so you can check that out. I did an interview for her. And so we're going to have Stacia, who, who does that podcast, on here to talk about her background with um, being a vet tech and um, some, uh, some of the research that she's gotten to do and travel and traveling as well. So it should be a really fun one to, to um, look forward to. Um, and check out Humane Nature if you haven't already. And um, I think that's about it. So also remember that we have um, a, a store on our website. So if you want cute little stuffies or Pac-Man merch, uh, you can go and go there and grab that. And all the money goes back to our research and keeping us doing cool stuff like this in the podcast. So uh, with that, we will let you guys go and we will see you next time. Bye. Bye. This was brought to you by Pacific Mammal Research, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. To learn more about the species we discuss, check out our blog. Head to our website, www.pacmam.org, that's P A C M A M.org, to check it out. Also, help us continue providing fun and educational content like this by donating today. Your help is how we can continue to do our work and share it with you. Thanks. <laughs>